Um, we certainly appreciate uh, everybody for being here today. And I know I looked out earlier and seen a lot of people that were missing and people that are traveling. So uh, keep them in prayer. Uh, but as we begin this morning, I want to recap a little bit of last week uh, as we discussed what does God's Word really say. And uh, again, we have been looking at on Wednesday nights and looking at uh, on uh, some messages on Sunday morning about the Word of God, what it says, the crazy claims that are made in some places, uh, and things that you can consider to be extraordinary or sometimes unbelievable. Uh, and uh, last week we looked at the epidemic of biblical illiteracy uh, where folks are just not reading the Bible. That's in our churches. You would expect that the world would not uh, be reading the Bible too much, uh, folks in the secular world. But as I showed you last week, Lifeway did a study in 2016 of a thousand Christians, uh, and within that, a thousand uh, folks were pastors. And it showed that 53 percent uh, of Americans have not read. Uh, the Bible, or they at least have read little to none of it. So as long as I can continue to do math, that means only 47% have read substantial parts of the Bible. And it's my belief that the lack of uh, knowledge and understanding of the Word of God is the root to most of the issues that you see in our society today. The breakdown of the home is a major issue in our in our uh, society today, violence, all the isms that you have out there with racism and bigotry and all the other hatreds and things that you have. The Bible teaches none of those things. It actually solves all of that stuff uh, if you'll read it and if you'll go off of what the pages of God's Word say. Um, so the wisdom of the world, though, uh, is throwing out God's wisdom, and they're saying, hey, just, just focus on what we know, focus on what man knows, rely just on the knowledge that we can obtain uh, in the world, and don't worry about all of that archaic stuff in the Bible. Um, so that's why this morning we're going to look at man's wisdom versus God's wisdom, and we're going to look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 31 to begin with. And it says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Um, and this first uh, opening up uh, here in 1 uh, Corinthians, um, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth and he is addressing many, many issues that they have within the church. If you really want to see a scathing review uh, from an apostle, read the book of Corinthians because he lays it to them in many different areas here. And he's beginning, he's gotten through some of his opening remarks, his greetings, his thanksgivings and all the rest. And he uh, addresses this issue uh, in the early church here at Corinth that they were uh, attempting to rely on human wisdom uh, and they were not submitting to God's way of thinking. Now this is in the early church, this is in Corinth. Does that sound like a church today? Sounds like most of the churches today that are relying on human wisdom and not on the wisdom of God. Uh, and so here we still have the problem persisting to this very day and Paul begins here and he says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Now that's an important statement. The gospel does not make any common sense to somebody who is not saved. Somebody who is on their way to hell. That's what perishing here is talking about, whether you agree with that or not. Um, but for those that are perishing, the lost, the cross just doesn't make sense to the world. Why would it? Why would it make sense that the God of the entire universe chose to come down in the form of a human being to live on this earth for 33 and a half years to experience uh, thirst, to experience hunger, to experience pain and sorrow and all the rest of it, to 
ultimately die for people who did not care to be killed by people uh, who just wanted their own self-interest to be in the forefront and to be mocked and scoffed at as he was nailed to a cross and his side was pierced with a spear after he had been beaten like we've seen and Dr. Ashley presented a couple of weeks ago uh, to us the medical evaluation of the crucifixion of Christ and we've seen the brutality that he went through all for what? Because what John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever should believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That doesn't make sense to somebody out in the world. Why would somebody do that? Because in the world, once you attain the status, if you are God, you're not going to come down from that perch. You know, people don't want to retire as a CEO. They don't want to give up their power and all the rest of it today. Why would a God go through all of that? It doesn't make any sense. And so they just explain those things away. Um, but to us, the cross is beautiful. To us, the cross makes sense. To us, those, as, as it says, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. All right? Because there's a difference in what you will see uh, depending on your mindset as you approach uh, the Bible. If you rely on human wisdom, again, the, the gospel message is never going to make any sense to you. That doesn't matter if I explain it to you, if I'm deep in apologetics and I'm defending the faith and I'm out here talking about all the logical reasons why you should believe in the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That logic is never, ever, ever going to bring you to a place of salvation uh, in your life. You have to have a God to be able uh, to do that. Um, you have to be saved. You have to have your mind renewed in Christ. Uh, and then you'll be able to see things in the way that God does. You'll see the redemption of the cross. You'll see that he, he died in our place, that we deserve to be able uh, to die in a brutal way as he did. But he said no. He loved us enough that he was going to step into uh, our shoes and do that for us. Now, I'm just going to say something to you. As I mentioned last week, there's a lot of churches. I, I drive down the road and Macon, we say, has more churches per capita than any other city in the United States. I believe it because there's one on every single corner, more than any Starbucks uh, or Subway that is out there. But it, you, you have many different churches that you can be a part of in this city. And I said last week at the end of the message that if you want to go somewhere where it's, it's all flash and light spinning all over the place and smoke coming out and you know the, the, you gotta have them you can't get to your pastor and all the rest I can refer you to several churches right now that you could be sitting in today uh, that's not what United Community Church is about and it's not what it'll be about as long as I'm the pastor of the church what we ought to be about is what we were singing in that song earlier God will make a way uh, and and about the word of God and and Wilma I, I think that song was speaking to us today uh, when we listen to that's an inside thing there uh, but uh, at, at this church we put a high premium on the word of God and being able uh, to stand on it because you know what at the end of the day the word of God is the only authority that the church has and you can stand and you can do all of these other things and it has not worked I was in youth ministry for eight and a half years I know exactly the what the, when you go out and you do all the fun and you do all the pomp and circumstance and you can attract people it is easy to get people to, to do things people are fickle they're like sheep you can get you can get folks to do just about anything that you want I mean I, I'm in sales outside of outside of here and people I just can't understand why people are so naive sometimes so you can be naive and you can go to many different places and they'll sell you this snake oil and uh, they'll sell you a gospel that it doesn't really make sense and all the rest and I'm not saying that all the world is filled with those places there's a lot of that in the world today and they try to go off man's wisdom and all the rest of it. That's not what's going to save you. That's not what the power of God uh, is going to come down uh, in, in, in your life. It's going to be the Word of God. And here Paul is trying to convey that uh, to the people here. And uh, he, says, he says that uh, as, as you look down, he preached Christ and Christ crucified. And that's what you want to attempt uh, to be able to do. In verse 19 it says here Paul is summarizing Isaiah 29 14 and he is he says for it is written I will destroy the wisdom of the wise the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Uh, and I love as he goes into verse 20 here uh, Paul is saying where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? 
Where is the philosopher of this age? These are three categories of supposedly smart people. The wise men, the, uh, the scholars, the philosophers. And he's saying, where are all these folks? Bring them here. Let's talk to all of these people. Um, and he says, has God, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? I contend that he has. He has made foolish the wisdom of the world. And I'll look at some of this uh, as we go on uh, uh, today. The world is seeking every single day. Right now there are people in all different types of think tanks and science um, uh, not classrooms, but laboratories and all the rest. And they're trying to come up with all of the answers to everything in this world, gather as much knowledge as they possibly can uh, because we are seeking after knowledge every day in this world. And the more and more we, uh, we uncover a little bit of this, and, you know, we have so much money right now that's being spent in space try, you know, trying to hear things. You have tons and tons of money that is being spent on microphones that are projecting way out into deep space to hear if we can hear the aliens talking to us and all the rest of it. And we talk about raising taxes to 80% and things of that nature so we can pay uh, for certain things. I mean, really and truly, if we would scale back on trying to see the exercise habit of shrimp, and again, you think that's crazy, there, there is a book that you can read about government waste, uh, and they had all of these studies that are out there. People study everything. I mean, I couldn't come up with a list of all of the crazy things that are being studied out there. And that stuff is wonderful. It really is. But there's a pursuit of knowledge that is happening uh, in, in our world today. Uh, and, and I love most of that. But God has made a vast amount of our wisdom to be foolish um, in the world. And, and we, we, we see that every single day. Um, human wisdom, and I put this in bold in your notes, Human wisdom oftentimes leaves us with more questions than it does answers. Every discovery, and we'll go, oh, look what we learned, but then that has about 10 other questions that are on the end of that that we got to continue to pursue. It's a never-ending cycle of asking a question, asking a question, and asking a question. So uh, I'll give you an example of that. Where did God come from? And then you say, well, it came from this. And then you got another question, where did his mama come from? Where does mama come from? Well, this, and you keep going back. If you, it's the same way if you give people a piece of knowledge today in hum, human wisdom, we got to figure out how much more there is, and it opens up doors of other uh, discovery. So I would, I would say to you that most of the time when it comes to humans having knowledge, it doesn't stop. There's not a fulfillment of that knowledge because we are finite human beings trying to understand an infinite world made by an infinite creator, and you'll never be able to do that. So it's a constant pursuit. Um, in verse 21, he goes on to say, for since the wisdom of God, uh, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the, fo uh, the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Now, when you look at this in, ver in verse 21, uh, in God's wisdom, understand what he's saying. This is God's sovereign plan here. In his wisdom, the world through its wisdom, didn't know him. You cannot know God by some human wisdom or knowledge or understanding that you attain. Do you understand what I'm trying to say to you? You can't look at the world and say, okay, now I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ because I see a mountain. That is general revelation and you can know that there may be a God, but you cannot have a personal relationship with God by some thing that you can touch or feel or smell or taste and all of your senses that you have. You cannot come up with an understanding of who exactly God is. So, you have to have more than that. And God planned it that way because if we could... If we could come up with our understanding of God and our personal relationship with God outside of him just by what we can do, why would we need Christ? Why would we need him? So he says in this verse that in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom and through its understanding did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Now what's he talking about, the foolishness that what is preached? The cross, Jesus Christ the gospel message. That is foolish. 
to those people who are perishing. And through that message that is preached and that people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, only those people, though, it says, who believe. So go back several messages ago. I said, what is the secret to believing? You've got to choose to do that. You, you've got to make a choice. I cannot make somebody believe in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what you do, what evidence you show people. Sometimes you cannot make somebody believe something. Let me give you uh, an example of this in current events. Now, I'm not making any determination about this because I don't put anything past uh, what our society can do. But uh, Jeffrey Epstein committed suicide, right? And you can look at any number of conspiracy theories that are out there about whether he was murdered by the Clintons or whether he was murdered by Donald Trump or whether he was murdered by somebody else that he didn't like and all of this. It couldn't possibly be, some of these people think, that the man really was a, a millionaire, billionaire, and he did not want to go through all of this, and he hung himself. To, to some people, if you showed them videotape evidence of that prison, they still would say somebody doctored it. There are people today that still do not believe that Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon. There are still some people today that believe, and I just read another conspiracy theory about the World Trade Center 7, that building, said no way did that building fall without it being de you know, demolished by bombs. I don't know about all of these different things out there, but there is, there is nothing that you can do to force some people to believe certain things, even if you showed them pictorial or video evidence of what has taken place. All right? They, they still, in their own mind, can choose differently, and that's the same way with the Bible. If you think they do things like that about otherworldly events in this way, then they certainly do that with the Bible. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what God's wisdom is. Some people, you're just not going to force them to believe it, no matter what your logical argument is is it has to be that they choose to believe and i want you to know sitting here you may have doubts you may have questions about certain things in the bible you may uh, question uh, uh stuff that, that, that i have said over the past several weeks and things that were presented here but the bible can be tested the bible can be set uh you know to the test of your logic to the test of the world and it can prove itself most of the time but you have to be able to have some level of faith that is out here uh, or we can't even believe in some of the scientific uh, laws that we, that we seem to subscribe to in our world today. So I want you to understand that God designed it so that our human brains could not grasp everything in this world so that we wouldn't be able to boast about what we did, that we'd have to boast in Him, and we'd have to rely on Him and not ourselves. So that's in His divine plan. And He ends this particular passage here by saying the Jews uh, are looking for uh, a sign, miraculous signs, and the Gentiles are looking for wisdom. Um, he, he says in verse 22, Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. The Jewish people in his time in Corinth and all the rest, they wanted the, the miraculous signs. They wanted to see things. You've seen that ask of Jesus throughout the Bible. He wouldn't give it to them when it was asked. They had plenty of miraculous signs uh, that were out there that were given to them that they should have been able to uh, subscribe to. Um, Lazarus uh, was a main one, but as we looked at a couple of weeks ago, they, they, Lazarus raised from the dead, and they wanted to kill him again, bless his heart. He just couldn't, he just couldn't stay alive. Um, and, and in verse uh, 23, and at the end of this, though, the, the Greeks is saying uh, they wanted knowledge, they wanted wisdom. You know the philosophers in, in Athens and all, they wanted to be able to understand everything through natural processes and be able to have all the wisdom. You just can't do that because we are not God. Um, so what do you do in the church? And this is, this is the point in verse 23 that Paul is making here about what he did and what we ought to do too. Our basic core mantra in the church ought to be that we preach Christ and Christ crucified. All right, that we don't get away from the gospel message, that we, that we don't try to make sure that we spend weeks and weeks and months and months and months 
trying to argue with people and try to lay it out here that, and get people, please, if you will, just, just believe if I can give you this one piece of apologetic uh, you know, defense here or this logical reasoning that is out here or whether it's trying to convince people about fulfilled prophecies in the Bible or the uniqueness of the word being 1,500 years, 40 different authors and all the rest of all of these different things. If you can't subscribe today, folks, to the story of that, uh, that I said earlier that we have a God that chose, didn't have to, he chose to come down here and experience what Jesus Christ experienced to die in your place. If that message doesn't connect with people today, then lights and, and, and loud music and dancing and all the rest of the things that people try to do in these churches today to attract people and get them to fall over and surrender their heart and mind to God is not going to work. The basic message of Christ ought to be enough to get you to say, I need to be redeemed. And if that message doesn't, I don't know how else we can convince you. There, once you are saved, then there's a sanctification and a building process. And you may still have doubts and you may still, you know, grapple with certain things. I certainly do. You can't understand it all. But when it comes down to the basicness, and I, I've gone through things before, and I've gone, oh, you know, huh, have these same doubts that people have, and the, uh, is God really real, and uh, the church, and all the problems, if you have been in leadership in the church as long as I have, you know it's ugly. Whew. Some, some people say, I want to be, I want to be a, a leader in the church and all that. I don't know that you do uh, I mean, get involved in some of things. Now, we don't have much of a problem here uh, you know, any, uh, anymore, but I have been many times in meetings. And you know, they used to call them board meetings, and they are B-O-R-E-D, board. All right, meetings, and they, yeah. Thing. We talk and pontificate our navel and all the rest of this kind of stuff and never do anything. Uh, well, that's not the way we operate uh, here anymore. We, don't, we hardly ever meet now. Um, but uh, when, when, you, when you look at uh, uh, our world today and you see what folks are doing and how it's not working uh, in, in the world um, and you see how people act uh, in, the, in the church and, and all the rest of it, I believe we need to get back to the central core message and, and stay on that because we're not going to make people, make people change. Now, I want to look um, at, at Proverbs 3, uh, verses 5 and 6. Um, and I said in your notes that we get ourselves into a lot of trouble when we start to rely simply on logic or human reasoning. And Proverbs, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 uh, tells us this plainly. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on what? your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight all right that scripture right there you ought to memorize you ought to put it on your hand uh you know write it on your forehead if you want to um because look back at uh at verse five for me joe that, that's 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 verse great thank you uh trust 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 is the first word here you have to trust God. You have to realize, I can't do this alone. And if you hear the gospel message, you'll know. It'll click with you. And I had a very long conversation with uh, an employee of mine at the bank this week uh, because I went up to my teller line talking to my tellers and all. And I, I came back from lunch and I said, you know what, I'm going to go fishing right now. And I went up there and I, and I started out by asking them a question um, about how can matter produce itself tell me that i said i said don't talk i'm not talking they said is this a sermon i said no 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 no. it's not i said it's just a question it may lead to one but we'll see uh and i said can, how can matter produce itself i said just explain that to me i said you all took science and i'd ask them what their favorite you know uh subject was in school some of them had said science so i asked that particular one that and we began to talk and then i said so so again science does not prove to us about where the origins of the universe come from and i said but but I can show you in the Bible, and it tells you where the origins of the universe come, come from. And this is going to get to the latter part of my sermon this morning. But one of my employees, I thought they were just going to, you know, kind of be a little shy about saying things. But I was fishing out there. And you know when you go fishing, you're sitting there, and a big one hits. And you go, whoa! And you lean back, you know, when you go, oh, one of my employees hit that line big. And I was shocked. 
I almost let him get off because I, did, I couldn't believe he bit this hard uh, on this. And he, and he was like, well, but how do you know that what's in there is true? And I was like, oh, I got one. Uh, and, and, and I was like, well, then, and then, 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 you know, Satan sent us three customers to come in the door. You know, I like we were trying to run a bank or something. I don't know what was going on. Um, <laughs> But, but, it, but anyway, I sure hope my boss isn't listening to this live stream. Um, but anyway, uh, with, I mean my manager at the bank, uh, but I know God is. But he, he's, more, he, he's more pleased with it. But we began to talk, and, and I had to go back and do a, num- a number two thing. But we went through, and we talked about things, and, and we got down to the core of it. And it, was a, it was a beautiful conversation that we had there. Um, but I, I said to them, I cannot prove to you beyond any possible reasonable doubt that the God of the Bible is exactly who the God of the entire universe is. Because you want me to show you video of him saying, you know, earth, son, we don't have video evidence of that, so you must exercise faith. But there is enough reasoning that you can have that you can come to that conclusion if you're, if you're open to that. But neither science nor religion can be able to prove to you 100% no a way that you could possibly doubt it at either origins, uh, you know, of Big Bang or whatever, or creation uh, is true. So you have to exercise faith and you have to believe. You have to do what that first word there says. You have to trust in the Lord with all of your heart and you've got to lean not on your own understanding that we know is already broken and is fallible, uh, but we should acknowledge God in everything that we do. So, Uh, Like I said earlier, every day the world is attempting to gather more knowledge. And uh, one of the definitions of the word science is a systematically organized body of knowledge on a particular subject. Uh, So science does not mean uh, in every sense of the word that you have to go into a laboratory with petri dishes and and beakers and all that stuff and do all these experiments. It is a body of knowledge, and that's what the word means, scientia. It means knowledge. Um, And And we know that scientists today are seeking to gather, as I've already said, as much knowledge as they can. And they gather that knowledge, though, so that they can apply it to the world that you and I are living in uh, today. And, for instance, Newton's law of gravity. Uh, We know that that's applied to our world today in many, many different, uh, you know, areas. If I was to walk over here, I'm going to fall down those stairs because gravity is going to pull me that way. Uh, There's many different mechanisms that we use when you're doing rockets. Uh, NASA has to use the law of gravity to know how much propulsion to be able to get out of the Earth's gravitational pull, all the rest of it. It's It's a wonderful body of knowledge and a wonderful law that we have that is applicable to our world in many different ways. Joe is not going to with any sense unless I give him uh, some notes that have about 400 scriptures because I think we've got 399 before. He's not going to jump down from that sound booth up there and think he's going to land down here without breaking his leg because the law of gravity is going to say and and, and air resistance and all the rest, he's probably going to break his leg. He cannot withstand that type of a fall there. Now if he was in space, he could just jump and he'd float. All right, so there's many different applications uh, to Newton's law of gravity. Uh, Medical advances in medical science. Uh, There are things that are are done every single day, uh, procedures that people perfect and come up with, medicines that are invented uh, and come up with that are applied to different uh, diseases and cures, and those are gifts of God. Uh, That is knowledge that God has given us and given us in science to be able to apply to our world today and to benefit us. There's no doubt about it. Science is a wonderful thing. It's my favorite subject, as I told you uh, in in my uh, secular uh, education anyway. Um, And so I want want to make any beefs about that, but just because man's wisdom grasps certain elements of our world does not mean it can grasp everything. So you have people today that in science, they say, well, look, we built a rocket. Look, we put a man on the moon. Look, we cured this disease and that disease, and we know how to pasteurize milk. And we did all of this stuff. And because we have been able to, with our brains, come up with all of this stuff here, we must be trusted when we start telling you about origins. And they make you look stupid because they are smart people. 
They have done amazingly wonderful things in our world today. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about that. We should submit to it. That through our brains that God has blessed us with, he has given us knowledge to be able to come up with wonderful, wonderful things in our world. But that does not make all of science God. Okay? Um, and, and that's the point that I want to get to because uh, when you look at the first law of thermodynamics, which we looked at a little bit on Wednesday night, a piece of that says basically, and you'd have to read the entire law, I'm not trying to teach you the law of thermodynamics here, but it basically says that mass and energy cannot produce itself nor can it destroy itself, that it is constant. It's the conservation of mass and energy. And so if mass or energy cannot produce itself, and we understand that it took energy for the world to come into existence, my question remains to everybody is how do you explain the origins of the universe? How do you get something from nothing? Science cannot, it is, it's the age-old question in science that they're still pursuing right now. They cannot figure out, even with the Big Bang, how those particles, how the antimatter and all the rest of that, where did it come from? We know how it produced and the Big Bang happened and the matter began to spread out and all the planets formed and all the rest. But that original matter, that original spark of energy, where did it come from? They don't know. They're still looking. They're still testing things every day, trying to figure it out. Um, I would submit to you. Uh, that's right. Uh, man's wisdom is only good to a point. All right. And we need, to, we need to understand the limitations of our wisdom. It cannot help us attain salvation. Again, you cannot get salvation by logical processes, by belief in just uh, uh, words of men and all the rest of it. That has to come from God. Uh, and science also cannot explain to you the origins of the universe. Now, I want to submit something this morning. If you solely relied on the Word of God, you would never feel that you come up short. You would never think... What is that other question? What in the world could you possibly come up with? What question could you come up with that the Bible does not answer? I open the floor. Anybody got one? Anything you can think of? This is a burning question that we've got to figure out that, that the Bible doesn't already lay out in some way, shape, form, or fashion. I'm not saying there's not one out there. I'm just, I can't come up with one off the top of my head, and I want to see if y'all do. It tells us the origins of the universe. We know where life come from. We know how it started. We know how all of those things happened. Uh, we know why we feel as if sometimes that we're inadequate because we are, because we're born with original sin. And that in and of itself is a lot of the problems in the world today. We have spiritual forces that are behind the veil with uh, the, the, the powers of Satan and, and the demons and all of the things that are out there. And the spiritual warfare that causes all kind of untold uh, issues in, in, our world, in our world today. The Bible has, is historically accurate and scientifically accurate in many ways as well. And I'm not going through all of those things that are, that are out there. Dr. Ashley went through some as a medical uh, scientist uh, that talked about that. What can you come, what burning question? Can, did we know about gravity through the Bible? There are biblical verses, but it's not a science book to teach you about all the, the laws of nature uh, necessarily, but I can tell you there was one uh, verse that I read to you uh, not too long ago about, uh, it was a crazy circumstance where this boy was listening to uh, uh, Paul speak and he fell out of the third uh, floor window and he broke his neck. Well, that's gravity right there. And, you know, so, you know, he, he didn't float. Uh, and then they, then they raised him up uh, at that time. But the Bible answers every, every age-old question that we've been trying to answer across all of human history. I submitted to my Wednesday night crowd the other day that the Bible is the only holy book that explains the origin of the universe. Every other religion will start with a planet and talk to you about the creation of life on planet Earth. But no other holy book teaches you the origin 
of the cosmos itself. So what I submit to people when I talk to them about this is, I, re, I, I have these questions, just like every other person. Where did we come from? Why are we this way? Why do bad things happen to good people? All of this kind of stuff that is out here and these burning questions in my mind about how the world works and all the rest of it. And I want to know. So I go to science and I go, okay, that's the smartest people on the planet. And I want to know the answers to these questions. Well, you know what happens? I come up short. They can't answer those age old questions. All they tell me is, hey, hurry up and wait. Give us a little bit more time. We'll figure it out after you're dead. I want to know now. I want to know. So if I go to the Bible, I can see every bit of it. I can see that the, the beginning of the story is here and the end of the story is here. We're in the middle of that or slightly towards the, the very end of it. Who knows exactly where we are when it comes to it. But we're seeing things that the Bible made predictions on that couldn't have possibly happened this way. We know for a fact that they weren't sitting down writing it together. We've seen fulfilled prophecy take place in the Bible uh, and it come out. It's historically accurate about things that they even thought before. Oh look right there. That's a that's an inconsistency in the, in the Bible. There are contradiction in the Bible because that didn't happen in history. We dug up a little bit of things a couple hundred years later and figured out, yeah, Pontius Pilate was in fact the governor when, they, when the Bible said he was. David, he was really a king. So you have all of these archaeological things, prophetic things that have come in true. So I look at the Bible, and as a logical, rational human being, this thing here just lines up with me, and then God, you know, and, but it did not do all of that until I realized, as a young boy, I knew there was something within me, the Holy Spirit tugging on me, I know what it was, drawing me to God, and I surrendered, and I gave my heart and my life to Jesus Christ. My mind was renewed, and then all of this stuff began to make absolute sense to me. There's nothing I've read in the Bible, as young as I am and wanting things to be proven to me, that has been inconsistent with what God can do in the world. It's the only thing that makes sense. So, again, human wisdom makes you fall a little bit short of all your answers. And I want to end with 1 Corinthians 2, 13 through 16 to let you understand the why behind that. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The reason we, the world cannot understand the things of God is because it does not have the Holy Spirit. All right? That's the reason why. You must have the Holy Spirit uh, indwelling in you to understand this. The Holy Spirit knows the mind of God. The Holy Spirit is God. There's nobody that knows God any better because it himself so just like you nobody knows you not your spouse not your best friend not your you know closest child nobody knows you like you know yourself so the holy spirit knows god exactly uh, and once a person surrenders their all every bit your body your mind and your soul to the holy spirit and to god himself uh, and that takes place that renewal of your mind happens uh, and then you begin to see things through the wisdom of god and not through the wisdom of the world and you have a peace uh, about that uh, the, as christians the holy spirit is the one that is discerning these things for us the holy spirit is helping you to be able to understand uh, all of it um and uh Everything fits together perfectly uh, as, a, as a whole picture when you're able to see that. And again, those who are perishing are still looking for the missing link. Those that are lost, those that don't have the Holy Spirit, are the ones that are still pursuing this knowledge that we already have. And I want to give you, for the most part in here, you're Christians, I want to give you an example of what I see in the world today with scientists that are still trying to figure out, and secularists, I try to say, because there's many great Christian scientists, but secularists, when they're still trying to pursue God, and they're still trying to figure out what it is or what the origins are, 
They're to me like the Jews during Jesus' day and Jews still today. They're still waiting. They're still looking. They're still looking for the signs for the Messiah to come. He's already come. We already know who he is, yet they're still in denial and they're still looking and they're still waiting uh, uh, out, out, out there to see. And I think that's a sad thing. And it's, it's you and I, uh, we're, we're the ones uh, that are supposed uh, to help these folks. If you have the knowledge of the Holy Spirit, if you have the mind of Christ within you and you can understand the things of God, it is incumbent upon you to be able to go to these other folks and engage them in conversation and maybe plant a seed Maybe you water a seed that somebody's already planted and God brings the increase and that they themselves can follow the leading of the Holy Spirit that has to happen in, in salvation processes and that they give their heart and life to God. Not because of a really reasoned argument necessarily that you gave, it's because it clicked with them the gospel message. I never, ever, ever would try to quote, unquote, and I don't use these terms, but save somebody by saying, look at, the, look at the trees. We know that's a God. Every other religion on the planet can do that. We're the only one that has this gospel message that is the power of God when we talk about it. So why has the church lost that power? Because we stop really focusing on the gospel. And sometimes, and in some places, we're scared uh, to stand on the Word of God. If you stand steadily on the Word of God, as the last thing that I said here uh, in your notes, <clears throat> it says, stand steadily upon God's Word, lest you be left standing in a foolish state. And I don't believe that I stand in a foolish state by believing that there was a creator God who was the first cause to the first of effect that was ever uh, uh, in the world, and that's where everything started from. And the reason that I'm preaching this to you today is because this book that we have, this Holy Scriptures, the very Word of God, is the, is the complete and wholesome word and answers to everything that we have in the world today, yet 53% of people don't read it. Go out on a limb here. A lot of y'all don't. A lot of you, at best, get an email or a daily bread book and you read about that much scripture in a book that's about that big. Or at worst, you wait seven days before you come back here for me to read to you less than 20 scriptures. That's terrible. That is not good. God is not going to be proud of that. I would not be proud of that. I would hope, let me ask you a question. If I only read four verses a week, would you imagine that that would be ample reading of the scripture for me to fill my role as a pastor? Anybody? Everybody pretty well agrees that that would be crazy. Why am I any different than you? I just have to prepare for my absolute meeting time that I know that I'm going to be here on Wednesday nights at 6.30. I know I'm going to be here at 10.30 on Sunday to teach you. But what about you teaching those people I was just talking about in your workplace? What about your children? You want our Awana program, which does a phenomenal job, to raise up your children? That's not our job. That's yours. It's the job of the parents to be able to do that. Now, last week, and I'm not going to do it again. Last week, I held up a $100 bill. I think it's because I don't have the $100 bill anymore. Um, but... <laughs> But last week, I held up a $100 bill, and I said, anybody knew the Ten Commandments 1 through 10 in order? Here you go. Nobody even tried for it. Okay? Now, I heard some people that may have studied a little bit um, on it. I gave you a quiz last week that I didn't give you all the answers to everything, and I did love that some people came and said, I can't leave until you get me the answers. And I mean, that was just an illustration <laughs> that I was giving, but I, I had to know. Uh, they were saying what the answers of that was. 
I'm not here to talk down to y'all about the fact that there may be many people even in the presence of mine right now that you don't really spend a lot of time in God's Word. I'm not trying to be ugly about it. I'm just saying our church will never be good if we have a bunch of biblically illiterate folks here. I don't know who you are. I don't know if you can't read. I'm just like that teacher standing in the classroom who just hasn't, and you know Mary Beth and many teachers we have in here, oftentimes you don't even know people mask it so well that they can't even read English in the school system. And Christians are a lot better at hiding their biblical illiteracy. But I can tell you, it doesn't take me long to be able to know how deep you are when it comes to that. You'll be of no use to yourself and of no use to God if you don't dive down into his word and understand more who he is. You got to do it more than a Facebook meme and more than just a devotional that you do every day. That devotional ought to be a daily bread, like one is named, and you can get some daily bread. But then you need to go eat the full meal and dive into God's word and do that. I implore you to be able to do that. I cannot help you do that every week. I'm sorry. Unless you're going to meet every single time. Again, I'm going to end by saying this. We do give you many opportunities in this church to dive down into the Word. We're going to be studying on Wednesday in the book of Genesis. You have that opportunity to be here. They have another Bible study in the back. Uh, that talks about specific, specific things in the, in the group of those folks that are recovering from different types of things in their life. You have that Bible study that you're able to go to uh, and, and get some word from that. Uh, we have Sunday school on Sunday mornings. Yes, 45 minutes to an hour earlier where you have small group time and y'all studying uh, in the Bible. If you're not here, our sermons are always been recorded for the past five or six years, and they're live streamed and recorded in video right now that you can go and look at that. I don't know how much else I could help you to be able to get to the place that you need to be. Or, and Jim has a Bible study for six and I'll start back up in September, right, uh, over prophecy. We have all different types of things that happen. And most of you only partake of Sunday morning. That's okay. I just really hope you go home and do your homework before the test. Okay? I want y'all I want y'all to dive deep. That my job as a pastor is to equip the saints for the works of ministry, not to teach you the entirety of the Bible. You've got to be able to do that yourself. And I'm telling you today, you may have problems in your home. You may have problems uh, in, in your workplace. You may be dealing with doubt and struggling with addiction or brokenness or whatever else. Or you may be sitting here trying to figure this God thing out and you're, ag you're agnostic and you really don't know you're right there, but you can't just get it all. The more you read and the more you study into God's Word, the more He's going to reveal to you. But all I want to prove to you today is if you're just relying on man's knowledge again, if I was searching for the answers, science would come up short. But the Word of God gives me the whole picture. Which one do I want to put my faith and my hope and my trust in? I hope you've done that today. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, though, this is your opportunity. You can come up to one of these altars as I'm praying, after I'm praying, whatever, somebody will meet you up here. And if, or you can sit there in your seat. It doesn't matter. But if you are here today, and, and you have not said, God, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe in Jesus Christ and that I want to confess my sins. I want to put my life in, into your hands and I want to surrender my heart and my life to you and let you, you know, live through me in some way, shape, form, or fashion. As Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you have not done that, you won't understand all of these things because you don't have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. And I would pray today that if you don't, if you feel today that you are not saved, that you would not walk away without at least letting me explain to you how you could be sure. All right, let's pray.